The Cooper's Ferry site is made up of a lot of different deposits that accumulated through time. And the most recent stuff actually would sit on top of this surface. This is the modern surface. So archaeologists and geologists use a concept called the law of superposition. And this simply states that in an intact sequence of layers, the things that are on the top are younger than the things that are deeply buried underneath them. As we go down, we're going deeper into time, and we can start to unravel the whole history of how the Cooper's Ferry site accumulated. So in this wall here in front of me, we've got two different deposits. One on top is more of a gravelly deposit that's got bigger rocks mixed in with some finer sediment. Below this, we have a lot of other finer sediments that are somewhat homogeneous, but there is a little bit of swirling of different deposits in them. From what we know about the history in the 20th century of the Cooper's Ferry site, in the late 1980s, there was a large amount of gravel dumped on top of the edge of the Cooper's Ferry site, partly to protect it from erosion, but also to protect it from people who wanted to dig for artifacts. So in this profile, you can see the pre 1980s surface. And on top of it is gravel, but it's not just plain old gravel. There actually are some differences. So in this deposit, we have sort of a coarser, big gravel that's rock on rock. On top of it, we've got a pale, kind of a silty clay gravel that is a little finer, and it lays this way. On top of this, we have a darker gravel that actually goes on top of it and extends this way. So what we actually have, I think, is the record that's created as a dump truck comes in and deposits one layer of gravel then it puts another layer of gravel on top of it and then another layer and it successfully moves the gravel deposit out 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 toward the river in this direction so this deposit that's in shadow is part of the stuff that's pre 1980s i think uh, and the reason why i suspect that is it's poorly sorted, it's got lots of angular road gravel, and it also contains some really telltale artifacts. It's got Shasta pop cans from the 1960s with pull tabs. It's got beer bottles, beer cans, uh, food cans, it's got fishing line. And what we can do with this is we can actually trace the edge of it as it proceeds across our stratigraphic profile here. And it goes this way comes back up, and then dips down again. So this area right here, I suspect, is actually part of a trench. And given what we know about the history of work at the site, I highly suspect this is B. Robert Butler's trench. The trench itself appears to be infilled with a lot of different mixed kinds of sediments, which is pretty typical of when you push dirt back into a hole. We also see there are some vertical edges there's a sort of a flat bottom that goes across, and on the far side, there's another rough vertical edge. So my trowel is tracing the edge of what looks like sort of a rough vertical line that transitions between more mixed deposits. You can see these layers of different colors that are discontinuous and swirly to the other side, which includes two deposits that are not nearly as mixed up at all. In fact, this one and this one look exactly like the deposits that the students are excavating in right now. And these represent floodplain deposits that we have a radiocarbon date associated with them of 6,000 years. So in this profile we can see the archaeological record that moves from modern surface with gravels into materials that were pushed here I believe during the 1930s during road construction that occurred along the Salmon River. And then below this roughly in a line about right here, we get into more undisturbed floodplain or as moving water deposits. And roughly at this boundary, we have a truncation of the archaeological record. So this deposit is closer to 6,000 years and right up here is 1930s. So we've lost about 6,000 years of time in here due to road construction that occurred during the Works Progress Act uh, construction here in the canyon. So the geoarchaeologist not only has to understand the landforms as they're distributed in a landscape, 
but the geoarchaeologist also has to know what's inside the landforms. So we see layers like this, this white layers of volcanic ash. It can help us get an idea about the timing of when this deposit was laid down. It can also help us correlate this landform and its stratigraphy to other landforms up and down the canyon. So the principle of stratigraphy is an important part of geoarchaeology. It can be understood by looking at this profile from Cooper's Ferry. And in this, I've drawn some lines that represent subdivisions of deposits that are similar to each other and different from others. So in this case, we can see a gray sandy layer that's overlain by a darker one with artifacts poking out of it above and below. And stratigraphy ends up being one of the most important skills that the geoarchaeologist has. The study of stratigraphy allows us to order and subdivide the site in terms of the events that created the site through time. The natural and cultural factors that added and subtracted and modified sediments as they accumulate and create this archaeological record that archaeologists study at the site. Here to my left, we've got some different kinds of deposits. This one here that's kind of a yellow deposit is uh, windblown glacial dust, or LUS. And LUS is a deposit that indicates glaciers grinding up bedrock somewhere in the landscape. In our case, it's in the Salmon River Canyon, there were glaciers in the headwaters of our river basin during the last ice age. They ground up different kinds of bedrock units into flour, you might think of it. That material gets washed down, blown onto the flanks of the canyon during cold, dry episodes of Cooper's Ferry's past. Beyond just looking at the geometry of everything we're seeing in front of us, we also want to take advantage of observations that tell us about the nature of the sediments themselves. Are they all the same grain size? And so grain size has to do with the size of the particles that are inside them. And so up here, these are really, really fine deposits. In fact, they're mostly very fine sand to silt deposits. It wouldn't take much energy to move them. And that can be important for interpreting maybe even how they were created. We can take these samples and we can actually send them to the lab, figure out what is the modal grain size, like what's the average, what's the minimum, what's the maximum, and how does that actually help us interpret the environment of the past? And the answer to that question basically has to do with things like the energy of natural processes. So wind can only move a really narrow range of grain sizes. Water can move a much bigger range. Landslides can move the biggest. Anything that can be moved on the Earth's surface can be moved by gravity. So as we're looking at here, I can interpret this to say, I have all these sediments that could have been deposited by easily by moving water or wind. They're very fine. So then I'm also faced with, how did all these other objects get in here? These cans and garbage and so on. Is it a natural process? It could be that it's a natural process. But as we dug this, we actually saw that it represented sort of a pit. It actually was a, had an edge. It has a sort of a deep aspect to it. And it wasn't a long trench. So I think that you can probably rule out natural process. The most parsimonious or the simplest explanation is this is probably a pit created in the 1970s by people camping here, burying their garbage. So beyond the idea of figuring out the layers what they're made of. We also want to worry about things like time. And I've also talked already about the issue that some of the cans themselves give us clues about time, but there are other techniques we sometimes have to use to figure out time that include techniques like radiocarbon dating. There are other methods that are uh, use other techniques that can figure out how long sand grains have been in the dark. These are called luminescence age dating techniques. Uh, we can also use relative age methods. That is, the deeper something is, sometimes the older it is. But in cases where it's intrusive, that breaks the rules. These are intrusive. They're not old. This can, for example, is not necessarily older than this deposit because there's a boundary that cross cuts and intrudes into this deposit. As I would work in a place like this, I would also try to you know, account, obviously, for everything I can see but to a certain limit, like you have to be a lumper or a splitter, like sometimes it matters to subdivide and draw everything, sometimes it really doesn't. 
Like I can just draw a line around this pit feature and I could say, you know, even in text, trash. Or you can make a symbol that's all the objects. Sometimes it does really matter, like you should actually show every single object. But if it was a huge deposit of gravel, I probably wouldn't map every single rock because I have other things to do. And that may not tell me more information about just that this is a layer of gravel. As you're describing the profile, you typically will give it some numbering system or some other symbolic system like some people use letters or letters from the Greek alphabet even, there's archeologists that do this. I typically use numbers and if I'm trying to account for the stratigraphy of a site, I wanna start from the bottom and go up because I wanna talk about it in terms of the sequence in which it was created. Now some people want to go from the top down, and that's fine. It doesn't really matter. You can do it either way. But, and, and sometimes that's actually easier to go from top down um, simply because you, you're probably not unlikely to get it wrong from this is obviously the first deposit, and then you go down. So if you do from the bottom up, you usually have to have pretty big exposures. Or if you find out later, oh, there's all these other deposits that I didn't account for, you can subdivide them into like 5A, 5B, 5C, so you don't have to worry about it that much. So once I get each of my different layers defined, I want to also, again, take a sample of them so I can characterize what they are at really fine scales, so I can understand what they are um, very well. And then I want to also understand, I want to understand how far they go in the site. Are they across the entire site? Do they dive down and sort of pinch out and disappear? Does like the boundary of this one sort of go down and meet with a lower boundary and disappear? Uh, does it get bigger? Does it get smaller? What's its shape? All those things are really important clues to understanding the stratigraphy of your site. Beyond radiocarbon dating, you can use relative methods like artifacts. So artifacts of certain shapes that we know that only persist for certain amounts of time, those can be used as relative dating tools. So just like with this, I know that pull tab beer cans only occur pretty much in the 60s to late 70s. They don't occur 5,000 years ago. So I know this is probably not a 5,000 year old deposit. I know it sounds silly, but if you know artifact shapes or technologies, you can really narrow down time pretty well. So it's good to become a student of learning about what things in the area you're working are really important. Sometimes it's pottery, sometimes it's, um, you know, stone tools, sometimes it's metal, sometimes it's ceramics that are decorated in certain ways. Uh, sometimes it's agricultural aspects. Other times and other places are things like the animal bones. So you've got animals that are only persist to about 10,000 years ago, then they disappear. You can subdivide this site. If we had that kind of fossil remain evidence, well, so like, for example, if we had extinct animal bone in this site, I can guarantee you that we probably would not find it in la layer six. Layer six is too young to, to have most of the extinct animals that we know about. By 10,000 years ago, almost all the animals that are going to go extinct, go extinct in North America. When I first approach a wall or a profile within a site, I'm gonna, I like to stand back and look at it for a few minutes and just sort of contemplate, you know, how many different layers are there that I can see? And what are the natures, what's the nature of their differences? Is it color? Is it one has some weird structures like 45 degree angle, different colored lines in it? Um, is one really rocky and one not really rocky? So I just sort of get a basic accounting for everything. And then um, I also want to contemplate the nature of the differences between them at their boundary. What's the nature of the boundary between each one of them? Um, so when we look over here, we've actually got a lot of labels on the wall already, which represents the stratigraphic sequence that I've worked out in previous years. And I use the North American Stratigraphic Code, which we've talked about in class already. So we would use lithostratigraphic units as the basic descriptor. From there, you can stack on or talk about other things that are within the profile. You can talk about what is the nature of the biological properties of our different deposits. So does lithostratigraphic unit three or lithostratigraphic unit four, do these have different fossil animal contents than other 
layers or not. There's other ways to break up the stratigraphy. We can talk about the soil qualities. So is there any evidence of soil development? Now down here we have identified in the past what we call the Rock Creek soil. It's a very, very weakly developed soil. And what it basically does is break up the deposition of LU3 and LU4. So whatever it is that's laying those deposits down, it appears that there was a pause in the deposition between the two long enough for oxides. So these are basically iron oxides to begin to develop. And so it's rusting the, the iron that's in the minerals. And it's percolating down in between the sand grains and starting to fill in the voids and gives it a slightly orangey, more orange color. And then we also get calcium carbonate. So carbonate will be created around the small rootlets that's uh, in the zone of evaporation within the soil. The idea of defining all your units in regards to their lithostratigraphy is important because what it basically is saying that I'm accounting for all the depositional packages, all the packages of sediment or all the layers that were put here in sequence. So I start at the very bottom, uh, which is normal for lithostratigraphy. So the very bottom, LU1, is the gravel that's underneath here that we can't see. And then two is a sand, three is this, what we think is loose, and so on. So some people do it the other way, they'll start at the top and they go down, down, down. But the point of doing it in reverse is that it gets you thinking about the sequence of site formation. Because one was the first one to get laid down and two is the second one and so on. So over in area B where things are more complex stratigraphically, um, we have to figure some of those things out, not in an easy straightforward way where you have a layer cake. Basically the lowest one is oldest and the, you know, the topmost one is youngest. But over there we have sequences where you get deposits laid in and then at part of the site you get erosion and then new deposits laid in. So you have to work out the whole sequence of events. And sometimes that requires radiocarbon dating. Like you can't actually do it by looking at it because you come up to multiple solutions. You'll say, depending on the age of this thing, those two, these two parts of the site may be contemporary or may, this one may precede that one. We don't know without other information. So once I define what my layers are, then I come in and I have a standard set of descriptions that I will do. And typically the first one I'm gonna do is I wanna talk about the depth. What depth do, do uh, certain layers occur? So I just, um, if I don't have a other way of measuring like a total station, I can say I'm working at a site, we don't have this, this stuff all set up. I might just put a tape measure on the wall or I'll put a nail in the top of the wall and they have like a cloth tape and run it down if it's especially long wall. And I'm going to note first maybe the depth below the surface as my original way of describing. Later on I might figure out the elevations relative to sea level and I can figure it that way. But I'll at least start with depth below the surface. And so I'll go down and I'll say well I think this is generally you know where the boundary is between the two so I'm going to take a measure here. So from zero to whatever that is 39 centimeters or something that's lithostratigraphic unit six. And then I'm gonna describe some things like the color. And I describe color by using a book called a Munsell Soil Color Chart. And it looks like a whole series of small chips you would get at the paint store for different kind of paints. But these are colors that have been um, standardized and agreed upon in people. So when I say to you, Deanna, 10YR43, you can in your mind go, oh, that's very dark brown. So if you know the system, you can look at it and figure out. And what it avoids is some of the craziness you see in archaeology where people go, oh, that's chocolate brown or that's, you know, burrito beige or some, <laughs> who knows what. They make up the craziest, craziest descriptors. And often it seems like it's right around lunchtime. They must be hungry or something. There's a lot of use of food and it's not useful because to me what chocolate brown is is not the same as maybe somebody else's chocolate. Maybe somebody likes white chocolate. I would throw it all off, right? So I wouldn't be right, chocolate brown, white brown. So the point is, is that we need to use standards. So one of the standards we use is related to color. Another one that we'll use is grain size and the quantities of different grain sizes. So I'm gonna take a hand sample and I'll get it wet and I'll feel, does it feel really gritty? Does it feel smooth when I rub it between my fingers? 
And that will tell me the relative proportions of sand versus silt. And other tricks you can do to estimate clay include, can I make a ball out of it? Can I make a snake out of it by rolling it between my fingers? If I do make a snake, can I make one long enough I can twirl like a party favor before it breaks? If I can do that, it's 40% or greater clay. So if I can, another trick is the ribbon test. You put it in your hand, you get it wet enough, it's not too wet. You start to squeeze it forward so it kind of goes like a conveyor belt out your fingers. And if it can get one inch before it breaks, then it has a certain proportion of sand, silt, and clay. If it gets to two inches before it breaks under gravity, then it has another percentage. So here in the floor of unit, unit uh, P, or in unit P, here in, in the floor here, we see that there is a blue box. There's another one stuck in the wall here. And these are boxes that we use to collect micromorphology samples. And micromorphology is the study of the constituent properties, that is what things are made of at a microscopic scale. We can look at the little particles, and we can also see how they're arranged in space. And we use this in archaeology in order to understand how things are perhaps made and maybe what's inside them at a really, really small scale. Nothing hides at that really small scale, so it's a useful approach. And also, we can use it to compare one kind of deposit to another kind of deposit. So you can make sure that they're actually different or that if you're going to compare the two things that they're actually the same. And in this case, we've got a box that's placed in the very top of the edge of the pit feature, that is feature P1, where we found all of the projectile points in 2012. As we excavate down, we're taking some of these samples so we can have a little bit of a representative sample of this fill. Now, what we do with this is it's got a little bit of sediment in there. I pushed that block into the ground and we dug it out. I will send that to a laboratory in Vancouver, Washington, and they will soak it in plastic and basically turn it to a rock, in a sense. And then they glue a glass slide onto it, cut it, and then grind it down really, really thin, about 30 microns thick. And that's so thin that under a microscope, you can actually transmit light through rocks. They're so thin that way. Under a petrographic microscope, a very special kind of microscope that uh, plays around with different wavelengths of light, we can figure out, basically, what this whole thing is made of if there's any really micro stuff in it, and ultimately helps us characterize, describe the archeological record of this pit feature much better than just simply looking at it with your eyes. So the difference between lithostratigraphy and pedostratigraphy is that lithostratigraphy is the approach of breaking up your stratigraphic sequence of layers according only to their sedimentary properties. What grain size is it? What's the nature of the grains, their shape, their angularity, their sorting? What's their mineralogy, perhaps? Are there any internal structures that show the way in which it may have been formed by water or wind or gravity and so on? Pedostratigraphy differs from lithostratigraphy because it's not about the emplacement of sediments. It's about what happened to the sediments after they arrived. So pedostratigraphy is the approach of breaking up the layers that you see in a stratigraphic sequence according to the soil formation properties that you'll see in different layers. And what I mean by this is that through time, as sediment is added to the site, there are periods where you will get stability and the surface goes relatively unchanged for long periods of time and water brings in fine particles. It can bring in chemical aspects like carbonates. It can bring in iron that gets leached in or weathered from the sediments themselves. Plants and animals and insects begin to make their home in that stable surface and they will begin to move downward, organic matter and other things. And in time, the sediment will change from its initial state to something that includes the additions of all these other aspects. In the absence of soils, generally what we're looking at, if you have what's called a conformable sequence, that are, there's no erosion that's removed anything out of your sequence. It's a whole series of just different layers being added up through time. And they may or may not be accumulating at the same rate, but you generally have a linear aspect to time. Something's being added you know, gradually through time, some faster, some slower. But when you get a soil developing, it means that sedimentation stopped long enough 
for everything to begin to get percolated down into the ground, plants and animals to take up a habitat and begin to modify it. But eventually you can get sedimentation turned back on again and it gets buried. And that's what we would call a paleosol or an ancient soil that once was at the Earth's surface but now it's buried. And paleosols not only show you markers where there were more stable surfaces through time, that can also represent uh, a zone where there is different aged archaeological materials. Because if that thing was stable for thousands of years, it provides the opportunity for people to come back to it over and over and over again and keep depositing more artifacts. Paleosols can also tell us about past environmental conditions. You may see aspects of their development that don't relate to today's climate, or they may relate to different kinds of plants or even animals and insects that once existed here but don't exist anymore. At Cooper's Ferry, we have two paleosols, and they're present in this profile. Lithostratigraphic Unit 6 has a development of a soil. It's very weak, and it's weak because it probably didn't have a lot of time to develop. It only includes the addition of a little bit more organic matter, and also we see some clay being moved downward through the profile, a little bit of carbonate being added. Down below, between lithostratigraphic unit three and four, we have the same kind of situation. But it manifests itself as, again, the increase in carbonate, a slight increase in organic matter, but we also see the addition of some iron oxides. So when this thing dries out and the light's on it just right, LU3 is a little bit more orangish red than any other deposit around it. So the usefulness also of pedostratigraphic units is if it represents a surface that was stable, sometimes that surface is really extensive. And you can chart out where, let's say, a paleosol is developed across a site as a way to say that is the same age surface, we think, as this area over here. You can imagine it's one constant surface. Over in area B, we have what we call the Rock Creek soil, just like we do here in area A. And what it shows over there is an increase, again, in a little bit of carbonate, slight amount of organic matter, but it has sort of this orangey-red oxide color when it's freshly cut on the profile and uh, it's dried out enough. The usefulness of finding that soil in different places is that we can begin to get a general idea for the relative age of the stratigraphy also from over there to here. We have a radiocarbon date on charcoal that came right from the surface of the Rock Creek soil in 1997. It's 11,410 radiocarbon years ago. That's a little bit over 13,000 calendar years ago. If we think that that soil also exists in area B, then we can already have a general idea for the age of the archeology span in that part of the site. So this deposit right next to me shows some really interesting stratification. So we can see layers that are dominated by rocks and then we have finer sediments that have some rocks in them, but not so much. Then the rocks can increase, then the rocks decrease. So there's different kinds of geomorphic actions creating this deposit. Probably rocks rolling down the slope. We may have wind and water moving sediments down slope. And they can accumulate together, creating these kinds of deposits. We have mixed different kinds of grain sizes and so on. Poorly sorted deposits like this. So I want to talk about the concept of unconformities in stratigraphy because unconformities are a pretty major part of understanding the sequence of events. If you have to sort of rewind stratigraphy as a movie, one event might precede another, or one event might uh, intrude into and change another one. And if you don't have unconformities straight in your stratigraphy, it becomes a very confusing. So just to define, unconformities are in a layered stratigraphic sequence evidence that you have either erosional loss of time or you have intrusions one unit into another or you have the simple loss of time or the absence of time recorded in your stratigraphy due to things like surficial stability. When I say surficial stability typically we measure that by finding a buried soil for example. That's usually the best evidence. Uh, there are lots of different kinds of terms that are used uh, in this whole realm of unconformity, but we're just going to keep it simple. We're just going to consider them all sort of as general versions of each other for now. In the wall here beside me, we've got a series of different deposits. And what's important is if we begin here in the corner, we have sort of a, a yellowish, tan, orangey deposit here. We've got another layer be below it. We've got another gray layer here. And these represent sort of 
what I think are probably the intact stratified deposits that we can trace around the corner, we can trace elsewhere in the site. Now, if we move a little more lateral to this, we see that there are a couple different deposits that cross cut this. So this pattern doesn't keep going this way. In fact, it disappears and it's replaced by this larger, darker deposit. Now there's some complexity inside this thing that has to be teased out to understand it uh, in its greatest detail. But the main point is that this layered sequence, because it can't be extended laterally, something else has intruded into it and eroded it and then deposited something within the void it made. That's a pretty important observation because now the vertical position of something inside this dark thing might, uh, might be a little confusing if you don't actually sort it out. So because this thing cuts into those layered deposits, we assume that this darker mass here is going to be younger. In fact, it almost has to be younger. In most stratigraphic sequences that include fine sediments like this, it's difficult to imagine how you get a geometry like this without the intrusion of a channel or a pit or some kind of other mechanism that creates a negative space that then gets filled in. If we're in an old growth forest, for example, this could be something that we might consider like, I don't know, a tree throw, let's say. A tree grabs the ground as it grows, it falls over, and it, that handful of ground you might think of as it's grabbing the ground gets overturned. Now this doesn't look like a tree throw at all because you would see some slumping and some other weird kinds of features. But what it does look like to me is something that looks sort of consistent with the concept of a channel. But we also can note that it's got, for example, like straight walls like this. Uh, as this was excavated, we also know that it was full of artifacts. So that's another twist to kind of add in here. So then you have to sort of ask yourself, is this a cultural phenomenon? Is this a natural phenomenon? And then of what type? So, um, but before we get too much into the what is it, we have to begin again with just the idea that we have to record what's in front of us. So we have to take the time to actually very carefully record all the cross-cutting relationships. Where do I have discrete packages of sediments and how are they laying on top of other sediments? And that is a process that actually can take a while to sort out. You may not be fully confident at first when you're doing it, but uh, I like to work at different times of day under different kinds of light. Sometimes I'll take digital photography, uh, I'll use digital photography as a tool, and I'll take photos and you can play around with color spectrums and do all kinds of things to try to get the most out of a profile. Uh, in the end, we may still be uncertain about the relationships between things, so we can use other tricks to try to tease out the relationship between stratigraphic units. So, this orange one, for example, that's sort of right here, we also see over on this side, there's a continuation again. And that could be the same surface that's just simply been eroded, like I'm standing inside this erosional unconformity, or the erosional unconformity is sort of at my feet. To be certain that this is the same as that, I can take a deposit of that and I can run different tests on it. I can see if the, for example, elemental geochemistry is exactly the same. And if they are the same, then I can have confidence that they are probably the same age, if not the exact same thing. If I get something out of this that I can get a radiocarbon date on, I can take that and then compare it with something I can get a radiocarbon date on over here and tie them both together. That's another technique. If I want, was to take a series of samples all the way down and uh, use another method like a luminescence dating method, then I could see, I would have a, a sequence of assumedly younger to older ages that I would hope would be repeated over here as well. If I was to do the same thing in this area where there's an unconformity, my expectation is that the radiocarbon ages or luminescence ages should be younger than the edges. So you can use radiocarbon dating as a tool to actually sort this stuff out. And in fact, I found it's one of the more valuable tools that we have over here. And uh, with some of the stratigraphic reconstructions that we've done here, radiocarbon dating played an important role. In fact, we would have been very confused if I had just simply guessed at the ages, I, I probably wouldn't have been correct. So 
you can come up with a stratigraphic model for how you think the layering goes and what's on top of what. And then you can test your model by using techniques like radiocarbon dating, other kinds of absolute dating methods. And th the answers from those tests will either confirm or deny your expectations. Um, it can be confusing. Sometimes something like this, let's say it's a channel feature, that can incorporate older material in it. So the radiocarbon age, age ranges within thing, of things inside here can be really wide. But that's also very telling. Because I would expect that this sort of orange deposit here, if that represents a soil, for example, I would expect that it has a range of ages that should more or less be consistent across its um, distribution. Here, we could have every single layer, if this is a channel, every single layer this alluvial channel cut into could be reflected in the radiocarbon ages. So let's say the orange one, let's just pick a number. Let's say it's 12,000 years old. And then everything below it is 1,000 years different. So 13, 14, 15. I would expect this channel having cut through this would have all those radiocarbon dates in it. Whereas a radiocarbon age on just the orange should just be about 12,000 perhaps. So that's, that's an expectation you can bring forward to then try to evaluate. So what becomes more challenging then is trying to differentiate, in our case here, why is this a dark layer on top of another layer, on top of another layer? There can be complexity within these features too that have to be accounted for. Some of that has to do perhaps with just simply the way it's formed in a natural sense, or it could be that we have multiple events of pit excavation and filling by people. So this is a place, the Cooper's Ferry site is a place that has been a focal point for people for a very long period of time. And it's not an enormous place. So odds are, if you're going to dig holes anywhere on this landform, you're going to dig into some older deposit, some of which might have been ground that somebody else also dug into a long time ago. So you could get a pit dug in the bottom of an alluvial channel that then gets filled in a little bit and then someone comes back, digs another pit into that, it gets filled in, someone else comes back, digs another pit. If there is a low point in the landscape, like uh, an alluvial channel or it looks like sort of a dry wash, um, that might attract people to dig pits for various reasons. Now we're not entirely sure what the pits are all for, but they do seem to be very concentrated in the bottoms of these dry washes or gulches as they're called out here. So. So if that's an attractive place to put pits, odds are you're going to intrude into other pits other people have made in the past. Um, let's see. So one thing uh, I have mixed opinions about is that when you clean a profile, you want to be very careful and scrape it. That's fine. But then some people like to take the trowel and draw all the lines on the wall. I think that's okay. But the problem is once you put a line on the wall like that, it can very much get in your head that that's the way it is. And that may not be correct. So sometimes I'll do it that way, sometimes I won't. But I'm doing, when I want to take photographs of walls like this and stratigraphic profiles, I want to do it without the lines on it. Because I don't want to bias the person that's going to look at this in the future into saying this is exactly how it was. Sometimes I'll do a two part figure where I'll take a photograph, show the whole wall profile, and just as it appeared, and then below it, I'll cut and paste that same image, and then have my stratigraphic line drawings on it. So you can see what I saw in the field, and then below it, you can see what I think is going on. But if I just simply superimpose it on the same image, there's really no opportunity for another observer to make their own mind up. So I think that's kind of important. As I uh, go through here and subdivide and come up with all the different divisions of stratigraphy that I think I can see. I want to also take a sample out of every single one of them and I want to characterize the sediments that are in them. That is, what's the physical nature of the sediments, sand, silt, clay percentages? What's the nature of the class? Are they rounded? Are they angular? How well sorted are they? What's the nature of the boundaries between the, at the bottom? What's the pH? What's your organic, what's your organic content? how much calcium carbonate is in it. I might look at the stable isotope geochemistry. That can actually help us if, let's say this orangey 
layer is a paleosol. It may have formed under very different conditions in other kinds of sediments, so the stable isotope geochemistry of the soil carbonates could be very tell telling. I don't know. You never really know what's exactly going to be the most important data for your breaking the stratigraphy out, so we just sort of have a big checklist and usually we just run everything through it and come see what comes out in the end. The benefit of doing it this way too, of getting a lots and lots of lab-based data to go along with your in-field description, is that it sort of serves as a double check for was I really seeing what I thought I was seeing? And two, will I be able to correctly report the data for other people? And the lab data hopefully matches your field observations, or if it doesn't, at least someone can look at the lab data and say, okay, I see what's going on here.